welcome to Subject to Talent, brought to you by Allegis Global Solutions. Similar to you, we're always trying to learn more. On this podcast, we speak to workforce and talent experts from around the world, covering market trends, technology, and our ever-evolving dynamic industry. Hi, I'm Bruce Morton, the host of Allegis Global Solutions' Subject to Talent podcast. Today, I'll be handing over the microphone to my good friend and colleague, Kathy Clem. Kathy is the Executive Director of Global Business Services for Allegis Global Solutions here in North America. Kathy will be joined by Rocky Howard, the Chief People and Equity Officer at the Mom Project, the leading platform for moms to discover their economic potential. Together, they're going to be discussing how organizations can translate good intentions into substantive and sustainable actions and real-world impact when it comes to their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Let's listen in. Hi, I'm Kathy Clem, and I'm truly excited to be your guest host of this month's Subject to Talent podcast, brought to you by Allegis Global Solutions. Today, I'm joined by my dear friend and colleague, Rocky Howard, a leading voice in diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is acknowledged as one of the top 100 minority executives two years in a row, and she is the host of the Voices of Diversity podcast. She is on a mission to help disrupt the intersection of diversity, recruitment, and inclusion. And she believes, and this is actually one of my favorite quotes, if we change the lives of those who are historically excluded, we change the world. I am personally thankful that you accepted the invitation to join in on the conversation today. So welcome, Rocky. Oh, Kathy, you know, you call AGS calls. I answer. I am honored to be here today. I'm so excited to have this conversation because I do believe we change the world one story, one conversation, one action at a time. So, so let's, let's, let's have a game changing conversation today. I love it. I love it. You know, we always like to kick off all of our podcasts by getting to know our guests a little bit better, right? Um, so if you don't mind, we, you'll just walk us through in the audience through your journey within the workforce solution industry. Yeah, it's a it's a long journey at this <laughs> point. I have been in some variation of workforce solutions for 30 years now. And I'm really proud to say that because I'm as excited to be here today as I was 30 years ago. And if you talk to several of us, we will always tell you there is no one way to join this particular industry. People don't usually wake up and go, oh, I want to go be a recruiter or I want to be in workforce solutions. And my story is no different. Um, I had come from retail. I was very pregnant. I was in Chicago. I was in retail management, had been leading a store for quite some time. And that store was robbed for the fifth time at gunpoint as I was in there pregnant with my now soon to be 32 year old daughter and decided that it was time for a pivot. You know, I think when you're young, you're cocky and you believe you're invincible. All of a sudden, when you become responsible for someone else's lives, you realize just how vulnerable you are. And ironically enough, I went to an agency and said, I'm very pregnant. I need something to do, but I'm not going to live in this state much longer. But I, I really would like something to do. And I took a temp job with that particular agency as their receptionist. So when we talk about climbing from the bottom, from the top and having sat in every seat that you could sit in, right. uh, <laughs> I certainly <laughs> have done that. And, and here's the really interesting thing. Before I did that, I never kind of understood um, our industry as a career path and sitting there and getting to know it firsthand, I thought, wow, I can talk to people and help them find jobs and change their lives. And I thought, yeah, this I'm all in. And so for the last 30 years, I have been, you know, involved in workforce solutions in one way, shape, form or fashion. I'm, I was very fascinated by project management and lean philosophies and took those certifications, which really started to help me deep dive and become an expert on the recruiting operations side. I am very focused on leadership. I'm very focused um, as a, a Black woman who certainly is well over 40. I'm very focused on the multiple dimensions of diversity, and that always became part of my leadership imperatives. And so all of those things started to 
work together, to come together. And I've been honestly just blessed to build a career and bring those all together. So I've literally started from a receptionist at a temp firm to being a chief in in the HR tech industry. It's been a heck of a ride. Oh, thank you so much for for sharing. And I'm telling you, um, I'm I'm typing and taking away some notes um, as a part of your journey. One, when you talk about, you know, uh, starting and climbing to, to the top, but the other piece, and I remember, you know, meeting you for the first time, it's around the, the multiple dimensions of diversity. But for our new listeners who may not be familiar with the organization, can you provide a brief overview of the MOM Project? Sure. At the Mom Project, we're on a mission to create economic opportunity for women and for moms who are returning to work. And for me, we do that in three core ways. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we do that by placing moms with incredible companies and in a lot of cases through incredible partnerships like the partnerships that we have with AGS. And we actually have created over $300 million of economic opportunity for mom. We have over nine hundred thousand women and moms in our community, lots of different people in our community, but certainly over nine hundred thousand people in our community that we work hard every day to create economic opportunity for by placing them in jobs. Two, we have our work labs division, which allows us to do deep research and partner with companies to help them understand where they are on that journey and partner with them to for them to drive deeper understandings in their org. And then as of course, there's momproject.org as our RISE program right now. And RISE helps upskill moms and particularly moms of color through certification programs. It's a scholarship program. And so we really kind of tackle the multiple dimensions of diversity in all of those ways by helping to create economic opportunity for mom. Wonderful. And thank you. Thank you for that. And I can tell you, uh, AGS is certainly proud to have partnered uh, with the Mom Project for several years now. Um, and it's exciting to see the impact that the organization continues to make. And just listening to you, I feel like every time we talk, I learn um, pieces of the Mom Project in the business that I was, I really, and honestly, I wasn't even privy, privy to. So today we're going to discuss, and you know, we're really discussing bridging the, the gap in organizations, D-E-N-I. And and this entire conversation around taking it from good intentions to lasting impression, right, or lasting impact. But before we get into the how, I I want you to really, you know, talk or I want to just get your perspective, you know, Rocky. Why is it important, though, for organizations to prioritize DE&I now? And, And what's at risk by waiting? For sure. It's such a good question. And I personally think of DEI in kind of two different roadmaps. We have to look at DEI as a human imperative, and we have to look at DEI as a business imperative. Um, and, and when you think about DEI as a business imperative, it's that importance of creating a diverse workplace that leads to productivity, innovation, retention, all of those things that are absolutely key. And when you think about the future of work, we keep talking about the future of work. You know, those of us who are in the industry have been talking about the future of work for quite some time. I would argue the future is now. A lot of us are in the middle of what's become known as the great resignation. Kathy, you and I have talked about this. You will know this. I think of this as the great recalibration. Yes. Because there's reasons why people are coming out of the workforce. And 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 we can chat about that in the moment. But if you think a little bit about what's going on, right? In 2044, what is now considered to be minority, and for those of you, you can't see me, I'm using that in quotes. I absolutely do not like the word minority. But the the majority will be minority people. And so if we're not creating cultures where everyone feels included, who are we going to hire? Because the majority of the population come 2044 is uh, is going to look like people who have been historically excluded. If you think about what's going on today, like 
57% of the U.S. workforce, at least, and, and it's not too far off when you look at the global numbers, are women. You know, 9 million of our workforce belong to the LGBTQIA community. And there is a statistic that says if we could actually really align diversity within our workforces, that would create 28 trillion dollars worth of economic opportunity. Which one of our companies couldn't use a piece of $28 trillion of economic opportunity? And I think that always ties in. We know that companies who are diverse perform better economically, especially as we have this conversation, we're looking at the microeconomic situation. It's not looking good. And Companies who are diverse, when you look at their profitability, tend to perform like 120% more profitable than those who aren't. So if you need business imperatives and you need to understand why this, all this, what feels like it's warm and fuzzy diversity stuff is truly not about warm and fuzzy. It's not just about the human imperative. It's about the business imperative, and we've got to get this right. Uh, and I, could, I mean, you, you said it best, and just to echo your sentiments, it's the business imperative as well. And, you know, $28 trillion, like, you know, who, who wouldn't want a piece of that just for the right, the right reasons, you know, right? But, you know, when I think about the impact of the thought leadership and the diversity mindset and the growth mindset that comes along with that, who wouldn't want that, you know, within their within their business? And, and I couldn't agree more. You know, one of the things that we continue to discuss with clients around the prioritization bucket, you know, is that there there is indeed the strong commitments that have been made, albeit, you know, internally. And we talked about it, you know, before internally and externally and even, you know, with commitments and, you know, signing up petitions via the CEO action plan. And so if, you know, companies or firms are, you know, still a little bit hesitant on that. I think there is no way really to escape actually having real results now and prioritizing because people are watching, you know, from employees to prospect candidates to, you know, the communities in which we live and serve as well as our clients. So the importance of why and now and doing it, you know, and having it top of mind, it's, it's critical for such a, for such a time as this. Well, and it's not just individually people are wa watching. I happen to be on the advisory board at an organization called Just Capital, mm -hmm. right? And so you have organizations that are actually looking at organizations and saying, this is where we commit it to, where is it coming out? And doing that assessment and analysis, you can no longer hide. It, 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 performative DEI is not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. So if organizations are understanding the business and human imperative or prioritizing DE&I, why is there so often a gap between, you know, from your perspective, this, this genuine, uh, you know, of good intentions, right? And sustainable actions when it comes down to organizational DE&I. Because it's complex and it's hard, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. so many of us don't know where to start. And so then we try to do all of these things that we usually work in a lot of other business situations. So let's look at the best practices. And so we look to the large companies and going, well, who's doing it right? And what does that look like? And um, in, in in diversity, it, it may not be a matter of who's doing it right. It may be a matter of who's got the largest marketing budget to make it seem like we're Hello. doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. right. <laughs> and, and so I also think that there's another challenge here where if you look at the top of most organizations, very few executives are not truly and authentically, you know, committed to having diverse workforces. And then we come from the grassroots up. And individuals are calling for diverse workforces and there's these grassroots initiatives. But what's interesting, a new theory of mine, is we get to the middle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you hit your middle managers. Yeah. And there is another stat out there that says 44% of managers say they don't have the time to be able to deal with these DEI issues. And so that's not necessarily their fault. 
But I think that is a byproduct of here, you know, when we give people a job, we say, these are the things that you have to do to be successful in this role. Mm -hmm. And we Mm -hmm. give them all kinds of operational things. You've got to manage your team. You've got to hit these KPIs and these SLAs, and you've got to deliver for the client and you have to do all of these things. You've got to go sell that product. You've got to go retain clients, these, you know, whatever your business is. What we don't talk about and where we don't hold people accountable and where we don't teach them is DEIB is a core part that allows you to be able to hit all of those numbers. And so there's a gap there. And then I think the other part of this is a lot of us try to make this really, really complex. We hire consultants. Look, I love the DEI consultants out there. There's some of them that are doing an incredible job, right? But I I think we hire them before we do the work that we need to do internally to really understand what does DEI be success look like in our organization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How am I going to communicate that? How are, how are we going to hold people accountable? How are we going to measure our progress? Where's the gap analysis between what success looks like and where we are today. And that's another piece of this that I think we don't like to be honest about where we are today. We're so afraid of putting it out there and going, oh, I'm not doing so well, that we then try to over-index and make numbers look better or perspective looking better instead of saying, oh, I'm at the beginning of this journey. And, you know, the reality is I've done quite a bit of work and research in this area. I want you all to hear this who are listening today. Most of us are barely scratching the surface, right? Um, we, I did some work in a previous organization and we surveyed over 400 companies globally against a framework that assessed their diversity hiring maturity. And what we found out is like 56% of companies don't consistently publicize their diversity plans or commitments, or metrics, or outcome. Why is that? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. It's interesting why they don't publish their commitments. I'm not quite sure. I, actually, I am kind of sure. I believe that they know if you publish it and I say it, then I have to be held accountable for it. And I think a lot of organizations are afraid to put their data out there because they're afraid in today's cancel culture that they will take the hit for not being further along in their journey than they are. So I, I I do understand that. I think people don't expect you to be perfect. They expect you to say, here's where I am and here's my plan for improving. So I think that you can be proud and not be perfect. I think there's an, another issue here and, and I could go on for several of them. I know we only have 30 minutes, but here's another thing that I think we need to tackle is that budgets haven't budged. So you mentioned earlier, we're giving all this money out externally, right? We're saying, I'm going to donate, you know, $100,000 to the NAACP. Okay, great. What have you done internally? What we're, and, and what we're finding is there are companies who are writing these big checks externally or doing that. But when you look at the budgets, we like that, that those companies that we talked about, we asked the TA leaders, do you have the right budget to be able to accomplish a diversity initiatives? And 68% of them said they don't have a budget that aligns with their stated objectives. That's a problem. And, and, you know, if our mouths have written the check, we need to write the corresponding check that allows us to be able to cash that check. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I am I'm taking notes because every time I'm with you, there's always wisdom and, and nuggets that you just pour inside. And not only me personally, but I'm sure those that are going to be, you know, that are listening with us, you know, to, to today. And, you know, the, the takeaway here, too, is, you know, it's OK if you if you don't have this built out and it's it's just not fully built, meaning it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. Right. You know, the, the idea of starting and starting somewhere and taking small but concrete steps and yes, opening up yourselves as in terms of organizations to be a little bit more vulnerable and just know we're all in this together. 
And it's okay. You know, this is a fundamental business imperative that we all are working towards trying to solve and identify a solution. And so, you know, just taking a step forward, right, is a step forward into progression. Now, I know at the Mom Project, and and I'm sure, you know, you've been working with some organizations that are, you know, getting it right, or, or at least getting it better, right, in terms of looking at results and, you know, um, building out their DE&I goals. Uh, you were, you know, recently at Allegis's Customer Council, right, in Nashville, and you shared this journey map, and you started to hit on it a little bit, but of how organizations, once again, can move from aware to invest it, to commit it, to ally, so what are some of those best practices that our listeners can, you know, learn from the organizations that are further along in this journey? For sure. Can I add one quick thing before we go here? Sure. We talked about why it's important from a business imperative perspective to get this right. We also talked about the fact that diversity is a human imperative, but it's a human imperative that affects our ability to attract and retain talent if we don't get this. And so I would be remiss if I didn't just mention a few stats here. Um, my friends over at Matheson do an annual diversity report where they reach out to historically excluded candidates to understand a little bit more about their experience as they interview for people. And this is where the diversity as a human perspective becomes critical in our ability to be able to attract and retain talent, right? 81% of underrepresented job seekers believe it's important for employers to invest in diversity, but only 6% have clarity on employers' diversity goals or efforts based on what they see in the hiring process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So again, we're all saying it's critical and it's important and it's at the top of our list, but only 6% of the very people we're trying to attract see that in the hiring process, right? You know, 62% of underrepresented job seekers report that they have experienced bias or been treated differently in our hiring processes. That That's a real punch in the gut. We still have 50% who are saying that they're see- seeing exclusionary or biased terms in our job descriptions. But here's the one that always sits with me because I have experienced this personally. 50% of our historically excluded candidates believe that being from an underrepresented community is an advantage, disadvantage. So they believe just because I look the way I am or just because I have this dimension of diversity, I am at a disadvantage. This is why to your point, as we think about this journey we need to go on, we need to think about what diversity looks like from a human imperative perspective, because this is the experience that despite us saying this is all really important, our candidates are going through. And, and you know what? And let me let me add to that as well, because y- you hit on it. And I want our audience and our listeners also to, you know, um, hear that you're right. It is. It's the business, and yes, we we certainly have to take small but concrete steps. But we can't forget about the overall candidate experience, right? And going from a prospect of a candidate, maybe they're you know proactive or active, all the way through, right into day one. And what does the culture look and feel like? Are, you know, your employee resource groups established or not? What is the representation uh, from an interview perspective? Um, Is there representation, you know, um, in leadership and in C-suite? So it it is. It is. It's a complete circle, right? When we talk about this journey, it just doesn't stop at the the selection process or right at the interview. Yes, you know, it's great work and let's, you know, continue to diversify our interview panel, but we also have to continue to pull the thread all the way through to ensure that there is a great experience for that, for that candidate is, is, as well. For sure. And well, I'm going to give you some, some steps that are really focused on the talent acquisition and the hiring journey to your point 
I would really encourage people to look at this as a full talent management framework. Okay. So from, from, from the old saying from cradle to grave for the whole life cycle of your employees, mm-hmm. how do your DEIB in, initiative, initiatives match? Because a lot of us focus on the talent acquisition process and we don't focus on the talent management process. And so I think when you're thinking about across the organization, Set those smart goals. You know, what does DEI be mean in your organization? How can we measure and communicate progress? Who's accountable for embedding and evolving diversity? Hint clue, it is not just your chief diversity officer or your CEO. And how do we hold everyone in the organization accountable? Because we're all accountable. And so if you think holistically, you've got to set smart goals that are aligned with that thought process. I think when you think about being on this journey and we, we kind of focus in on, on hiring, I think everyone should have a diversity hiring blueprint, right? And again, in a previous life, I, I helped an organization build one and you want to think about kind of four core pillars. One What's your diversity brand equity? We all know companies with brand equity are able to attract more candidates. So what's your diversity brand equity? Do they know your commitment to diversity? What are those job descriptions looking like, et cetera, right? What is your diversity brand equity? When people come look at your company, can they see themselves represented in an authentic, authentic manner. That's number one. I think number two is really about sourcing strategically, right? Do you have tailored sourcing strategies? Are you cultivating a diverse community? Um, Do you make sure you've got internal hiring processes? Do you have partners like AGS and the Mom Project who have this top of mind and have expertise that can help you do this, right? And if we can help you attract candidates Are they going to go through, number three, a fair hiring process? You called it out earlier. Do you have diverse hiring teams? And I will tell you, back to that Matheson report, Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think it is 76% of underrepresented job seekers have observed a lack of diversity on interview panels. That's no small number, 76%. And why is that important? Because When you talk about taking the bias out of interview process, which is part of this fair hiring process, if nobody on the interview panel represents various dimensions of diversity, then how can they see the bias? It's a, it's a tough struggle there. And then do you have structured interview processing? right? Do you have scorecards? Do you have structured interviews that ensure that everybody is getting measured by the same measuring stick? And then I think finally, that fourth pillar is really all about organizational support. Do you have clear goals? Do you have specific hiring goals, not quotas? So this is where sometimes this gets really itchy, but you can't get someplace if you don't have a goal for where you're going. And so where is it that we want to improve diversity in our organization? What does that look like? How do I drive top of funnel people that represent? those dimensions of diversity into my process. And, you know, I'm a big believer in this. How do we hold leaders accountable and how do we train them to do the appropriate things? So I think when you think about the roadmap, those are the four key pillars. And I like it because it is clear, concise, and it's actionable. I heard focus on the diversity brand equity really being intentional and deliberate around your sourcing strategy, you know, building the right ecosystem um, that's going to help cast the largest and the widest opportunity for talent, their hiring processes, and of course, looking at, you know, the organizational support. Um, And when we sum it up and we kind of look at these four pillars and elements, it's the end to end. It's the cradle. It's the cradle to grave. You know, um, we could probably talk about this topic for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, I I have to say, you know, here at AGS, you know, this this topic is near and dear to to me personally, um, as well as to the, the company. And our goal is to continue to try to weave it into 
everything that we do from the workforce, the workplace, and the marketplace internally, externally with our clients as well. Um, And you've said a lot that has helped resonate with me, um, especially around the talent management piece, right? And focusing on TM coupled with TA, not one or the other, right? But it's an and, right? That's going to bring the two to, together. All right. You know what? Final question. If I if I had to go to the final and the, the end here. So let's let's talk about future, future state and this, you know, crystal ball, right? If if you had a crystal ball, Rocky, where do you see the workforce solution industry? in a few years when it comes down to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? Right. You know, it's a really interesting question because I think a lot of times we are relegated to the top of the funnel, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when you think about us being able, as a workforce solutions provider, our goals are really always to provide the best talent to our clients. I think now when you think about how we do that, we're going to continue to evolve and change. And you see a lot of us doing that today. So you see a lot of us that are workforce solutions providers having chief diversity officers. You see a lot of us having diversity strategies for how we attract. And it's going to move from just our ability to be able to go source, but how do we actually connect and communicate with these communities and build deep relationships with multiple dimensions of diversity candidates that we continue to nurture, that we help support and grow, that we may be doing things like creating um, training and development for our pool and getting that supported. I think you'll see more content-driven support for that particular pool so that we help develop that pool and understand which clients they're best suited in. I think that the expectations for us as workforce solutions providers, I think those candidates are going to have elevated expectations for us as the middleman than what they had a few years ago. I think if I looked back to when I started in the game, you know, it was really about, I'm going to use that workforce solutions provider to make a connection to company over here. I think now we have to think about the fact that the gig economy is here to stay. Um, you've got somewhere between 2.2 and 5 million women who have opted out of the workforce because they can't work according to the rules. They're looking for more flexible, improve, more flexible options to work. And so now this workforce solutions provider becomes more of a partner than a stepping stone than before. So, you know, top of mind, when you ask me what I see for us in the future, I think those things are all going to come into play. Wow. Well, I I hope to have this conversation a couple of years from now, but I know our paths will cross before then. (laughs) Way before then. Right, right. So well well stated. And again, um, thank you. You know, a a big thank you for sharing your wisdom, your experience, and and always your, your voice to such a really important topic. So where can listeners go to learn more about The Mom Project? Well, absolutely. Momproject.com. If you're, you know, please, if you're interested in partnership, if you know people who need to join our community, that's the way to find it. If you know people who could use some upskilling or your organization would really like to support scholarships for women of color and moms of color and help create some of that economic opportunity, momproject.org. If you're looking for the latest thought leadership, um, in this area, worklabs.com. We're, you can find us in all three places. And certainly we're on social and LinkedIn and, and Instagram and all of the places. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And on that note, we'll end it. Take care. To learn more about AGS, please check us out at leadersglobalsolutions.com. You can also send questions for me or our guests. Just tweet us here at Elitist Global with the hashtag subject to talent or email us at subject to talent at leadersglobalsolutions.com. 
And if you enjoyed our podcast today, please subscribe, rate us, and leave a review. Until next time, cheers.